by way of introduction, I am Jess Armine. I have 45 years healthcare experience. I've been an EMT paramedic. I've been an RN. I'm a doctor of chiropractic since 1986. I have got emergency department uh, training. I've been a critical care nurse. I have expertise in epigenetics, forensics, methylation, neuroendoimmunology, which I'll explain in a little bit, functional medicine, nutrigenomics, supply kinesiology, live blood cell analysis, and Okay. Well, anyway, I have a lot of nicknames, some of them not so complimentary, but the two that have stuck are the neurotransmitter whisperer and the Sherlock Holmes of chronic diseases, which is the picture you see. Okay. So hopefully I'll live up to my nicknames. Uh, just so everybody knows, I put my financial and competing interest disclosure. I'm self-employed independent healthcare practitioner in the United States. I'm not being compensated for this webinar. I have no financial or competing interest with the LDN Research Trust or any other person or entity mentioned herein. And the, ex the opinions expressed are my own and do not represent the policies of the LDN Research Trust, okay? And I never take anybody's information without giving them acknowledgement. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Ben Lynch, who's letting me use uh, some of his genetic information. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lambert in Australia, who um, is letting me use some of the concepts in her book that is co-authored co by myself. I'll slow down, don't worry. Uh, leaky Gut, Leaky Cells, Leaky Brain, and Jillian Crowther, who is um, the chief researcher at, at the AONM.org for the use of her cell danger response slides. This is going to be a unique seminar, webinar, okay, because I have the pleasure of speaking to medical professionals and lay people. Okay, so here's how it's going to work. I am not looking to talk over anyone. You're not going to be impressed that I can pronounce polysyllabic terms, okay, but I do need to speak to the professionals and to everybody else. So if I'm going through something that seems very technical, worry not, just wait for another slide because guess what? I'll be explaining it simply after that. By the end of this, you're gonna know how, to how a functional medicine practitioner thinks. You're going to know how we go about looking at things because we're gonna do some case studies and I'm also gonna give you tips on how to pick out a practitioner. Okay, very good. So here we go. So what can you expect today for everybody we're going to define what a functional medicine practitioner is and does, discuss the difference between classical and functional medicine, show you how to how a how you will benefit from in, a true integrative approach, put it all together with some case studies, and like I said, some tips on how to pick out a practitioner. For the professionals listening, the purpose of this lecture is to be cohesive, not divisive. Let's face it, guys and gals. For far too long, our professions have been in divergence and the only people suffering are our patients. So please do not take anything that I say amiss. I'm not being adversarial, but I will point out some simple truths. And the whole goal here is so that we need to work together for the highest good of, our, of those we serve. Okay, so what's the real difference between classical and functional medicine. By the way, I'm going to use the term functional medicine practitioner. You're going to see it abbreviated, abbreviated as FMP. And that's going to represent any healthcare professional that practices within the parameters you're going to see that I'm about to share with you. These practitioners do have varied backgrounds and degrees. Now, in medicine, I've been around for a long time. Okay. I mean, really. Okay. In medicine, there's this uh, buzzword, evidence-based medicine. And it used to be let's find the best evidence to treat people. But where did that evidence come from? And I think our medical colleagues would agree that it used to be patient values and preferences, but it became industry values and preferences. Because, well, for true, because you know, I'll show you in a minute. And it was industry funded clinical expertise. So the studies coming out are funded by the industry. And the best evidence isn't necessarily the best evidence. Now, on the other hand, functional medicine practitioners tend to start using things like genetics, digestion, structural, mechanical stuff, and what seems like woo-woo, like energy things, okay? So functional medicine, from the classical point of view, I found this in Wikipedia. <clears throat> so I'm going to read it. Functional medicine is a form of alternative medicine that encompasses a number of unproven and disproven methods and treatments. 
Its proponents claim that it focuses on root causes of diseases based on interactions between the environment and gastrointestinal, endocrine, and immune systems to develop individualized treatment plans. It has been described as pseudoscience quackery, and it is at its essence a rebranding, rebranding of complementary and alternative medicine. By the way, I'm from Brooklyn, okay, so I talk very fast. I'm going to calm down, okay? And for those in the, in the UK, I know you like the Brooklyn accent, so every once in a while, I slip into it. But this begs the question, why would the assessment of root causes, the proven relationship between the environment, endocrine, and the immune systems, like in psychoneuroimmunology, psychoneuroendocrinology, neuroendoimmunology, gut-brain axis, and so forth, and the development of individualized treatment plants be considered quackery? Hmm. Well, here's some things I want you to, this is a saying that I want you to hold on to. <clears throat> this was said by Sherlock Holmes, by uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I have no data yet. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data because insensibly one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. And this is a critical thing. In traditional medicine, they will take sets of symptoms and labels and label them as diseases for the purpose of identifying a matching pharmaceutical protocol essentially treating the result of the illness, not the illness. And anybody with a chronic illness can attest to this. But how did it get this way? And I've been around a long time. So in the 1960s area and before, especially the United States, the general practitioner was king. The general practitioner was the person who knew you, who went to your house in the middle of the night if you were sick, knew your family and was your advocate. So if you got sent to a specialist, that specialist would barely talk to you and say, I'll call your doctor. And your doctor would pick it up from there because that was the person you trusted. The 1970s came along and there was this transition to specialties and the GP was snubbed by the medical community. Medical training was done by referring to algorithms with suggested treatment protocols. Um, anyone who's from that time remembers doctors walking around with these little books inside their lab coats, they were called little brown spirals. And they were very cool. If you had a lot of knowledge, you just didn't know what to do with it. You could follow these algorithms along and they would give you suggested protocols, testing, and you could follow it along and make a diagnosis. Well, soon thereafter, medicine became corporatized. No longer were doctors and nurses running it. Corporations, and we know that corporations like their profits. So the suggested protocols became standards of care, meaning that if you didn't follow the straight and narrow, you were, considered, you were committing malpractice. Diagnoses had to be proven by tests. And we all know that sometimes the tests don't exactly show what's wrong. Physicians were given less and less time to be with their patients. I don't think anybody out there can argue with the fact that you know, you used to be able to spend some time with your family doctor, tell them what was going on and so forth. Now, if you get five to 15 minutes, you're lucky. And doctors had barely enough time to address the chief complaint and, and usually became hemmed into their own specialties without talking to one another. OK, and they just kind of went into their little you know, holes and saying, OK, this is what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to do. So guess what? And I feel bad. Medical physicians can't be physicians any longer. Okay, this resulted in treatment according to the acute care model, which I'll explain in a couple of minutes. And who has suffered are those with chronic conditions, because chronic conditions require a lot more work. So in the acute care model, which is what how medicine is run today, the premise is get rid of the root cause and the body will heal itself. Not necessarily true. And when a condition becomes chronic, People are taught to manage it rather than to try and cure it. And here's why, because there's confusion as to why someone will not heal. A lot of times the patient themselves is blamed, okay, being histrionic, symptom magnification, malingering. And the conclusion sometimes is that there are certain pathologies that cannot be healed. The common wisdom these days is that Lyme disease cannot be healed. Uh, I want to say nonsense because it is nonsense. Okay, the functional medicine premise is that there are root causes, things that cause problems, and downstream effects, symptoms created by the root causes. If you identify both and treat both, you have a 
good shot at healing something. In chronic conditions, those, those um, mechanisms that get you he healing again will not reboot without intervention. You have to intervene. And both foundational treatment, which is treatment of the cells and the tissues and so forth, and targeted root cause treatment need to be administered. And in addition, the functional medicine practitioner will delve into the effect of the person's belief system and coach them into a healthy mindset, which believe it or not, is scientifically proven to be super important. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, what is necessary is a blending of allopathic and functional medicine. Neither profession has all the answers. If we could actually integrate in true integrative medicine, not some of the stuff that you see out there these days, which are really just rebranding or something else. Okay, if we could give somebody the best of both worlds, there'd be very little illness. So collaborating is the best way. Okay, what holds us back from collaborating? Well, <clears throat> it's the way we think about things. I'm leading to something here, people, okay? I could do a lecture on take this for that, take this for that, take this for that, and you know, here's a whole bunch of vitamins and so forth, but that's not getting anybody anywhere. You have to know how to think of these things, okay? I treat complex multifactorial cases very successfully all the time. It's the point of view, it's the thinking process. So what has separated us, the alternative and traditional medicine people? One, basing treatments solely on scientific proof as demonstrated by placebo-controlled double-blind studies. And everybody says, well, what's wrong with that? Well, <laughs> or who's, who's paying for the studies? Okay, I'm not even going to go into the conspiracy stuff. No, no. You know as well as I do, depending on who's paying for the studies, and you're going to get the answers you're looking for. And worse, ignoring observational or anecdotal evidence that may lack enough scientific studies, according to the, pre to the previous. And more than that, ignoring intuitive insight, thereby forgetting the wisdom of Albert Einstein, who said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Now I'm not getting woo woo here, I'm not going sky high, but when I'm taking care of a child, and I take care of a lot of autistic children and other children, when a mother's intuition says, bump, bada, bump, I listen, okay? So for today, just today only, let's agree to not depend on a single source of data. Let's agree that we will consider data that was up to this time considered unusable because it was unproven, alternative, woo-woo, or simply unfamiliar to us, okay? So how are we going to do this? We're going to accept a combination of scientific and clinical data utilizing intuitive insight. And never, ever, ever say or even think that can't happen. By the way, I mentor and teach a lot of doctors. If I even think they're saying that word, they get kicked out of the course. Why? It cuts out lines of, lines of investigation. We need to open our minds by saying or thinking, I wonder how that happened. So when a patient says a particular symptom, you just don't shake your head and say that can't happen, okay? Start thinking why that would happen, okay? Why has functional medicine flourished? Well, we've kind of picked up where everything's left off. So when a desperate mother has a suffering child that no one else could diagnose or treat successfully, it's the functional medicine practitioner that takes up the gauntlet because we think outside the box. And in pure New York Brooklynese, in other words, who are you gonna call? That's the Ghostbusters thing, okay? We shine with chronic illnesses, autoimmune disorders, um, fibromyalgia, polymyalgia, MS, Parkinson's, ME, bipolar disorder, and so forth. So let's agree on what a chronic illness is and not, okay? Chronic illnesses have something that set them off, okay? And have resulted in specific expressions. Chronic illnesses are physiologic processes, okay? As, as such, they can be resolved. Chronic illnesses often require a multidisciplinary approach. Chronic illnesses require a different point of view on the, on the uh, part of the practitioner. That's why I'm constantly saying complex multifactorial illnesses because they're all multifactorial, okay? Let me tell you what they're not. Chronic illnesses, you're not born with one, 
okay? They're not the fault of the patient, okay? Chronic illnesses are not chance occurrences or rolls of the cosmic dice. And I know I'm going to get it for this, okay? Autoimmune disorders are not unrecoverable. It's a double negative, right? <clears throat> as, they have, as they have precipitating factors that initiate the pathologic process. And people who argue with me about that and actually survive the argument, that's a joke, okay? Uh, I always ask them, why now? In other words, if you have rheumatoid arthritis or you develop Hashimoto's, anything that's considered autoimmune, why at a certain point? Well, it's genetic. Well, if it was genetic, how come it wasn't at birth? Okay, you have to open it up and saying, well, maybe a set of circumstances kicked off the genetic predisposition. And I'm gonna show you how we think about that, okay? So here's the functional practitioner thought pattern. In other words, what does it mean to think outside the box? Okay, first thing, all of life happens within the cell and it's protected and supported by the cell membrane. We tend to think in diagnoses, you know, all these diagnoses out here, but everything starts with the health of the cell. So if you heal the cells, you heal the body. Because the fact is that cells get together, they become tissues. Tissues get together, they become organs. Organs get together, they become organ systems, and then you have a person. The basics of cellular function, very simple. They create energy, they manage energy, and they waste manage. Uh, my good friend, Sean Bean, this muscular guy on the right-hand side, and myself developed a Doth thought paradigm called bioindividualized medicine a while ago. It's not something you buy. It was simply a thought paradigm. And it included considerations of epigenetics, mitochondrial function, the NEI super system, which I'm going to explain, and cell membrane integrity, that if we thought about all of these things and looked for aberrations, we wouldn't miss too much and we'd start healing people. And I'm gonna go through one thing at a time, okay? We're gonna start off with mitochondrial function. By the way, do you ever notice that different chronic illnesses kind of have the same symptoms? They may have a little bit different here and there, but they all have fatigue, they all have chronic pain, mood changes, brain fog. You know, I noticed that too. And I was wondering, was there a common denominator? And in 2013, Robert Navio, who is an MD, PhD at the Metabolic and Mitochondrial Disease Center at the University of Southern California Medical School, wrote a, wrote a paper called The Cell Danger Response. And it described what happens in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, when it is attacked. Okay, this is the paper itself. And if you really want to lose your hair, start reading this paper, okay? Because essentially what the cell danger response is, is how our cells respond to a threat that could injure or kill it. And it basically happens in our mitochondria and they will, the mitochondria will downregulate as a protective mechanism, ignore it. When I say a word that you don't understand, ignore it because you know I'm gonna explain it on the next slide. So for the scientifically minded amongst us, this is exactly what happens. The mitochondria will decrease oxygen consumption and essentially oxidize the internal environment it will stiffen the membranes to kind of trap the bug. Okay, it will release antiviral and antimicrobial chemicals, specifically hypochlorous acid, not hydrochloric, but hypochlorous, which is available everywhere. And we were using it a lot during COVID. There's increase in mitochondrial fission, there's interference with DNA methylation, and the cells do this in order to kill the invader. But I'm a big one on if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. <clears throat> That's why when I have explanations, you don't hear me using a lot of big words. So this is what the cell danger response, response is. And it's really important that you understand this. It's the metabolic response of the cell to protect itself and you from harm. It's the basis of reestablishing your normal function. And it all occurs in the mitochondria. The mitochondria, gee, remember the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell? <clears throat> this is exactly where all of life is because this is what produces our energy. And I found this little uh, thing, Mito the movie, medical community's best kept secret. Okay, yes, it may all be in your head, but it could be affecting other organs too. Got Mito? You're not alone. Don't know a thing about it? <laughs> You're not alone either. It's complex. But guess what? Fix this 
and you fix everything. So what activates the cell danger response and what causes the initial damage to the mitochondria? Well, it kind of makes sense. This I made myself based on the cell danger response paper. Think about it, heavy metals, plastics, benzene, all that kind of stuff, obviously will injure a cell. Mold, fungi, bacteria, viruses, parasites, easy, right? But what has been ignored and is just as injurious is all the psychological, emotional, and spiritual things that fall us, like yelling, abuse, isolation, abandonment, PTSD. It doesn't have to be one big event. It could be a non-nurturing childhood, okay? And the cells will be damaged just as much as if you poured mercury in them. And this is proven on a scientific basis. So the next time somebody says it's all in your head, okay, you can take the particular scientific paper I'm going to show you and throw it at them. Okay, because the heart is a psychoneuroendocrine and immunologic organ. Okay, this is taken from, where is it? Oh, Advanced Experimental Medical Biology in 2000, where is it, 2018? Yeah, okay. And essentially this said that the heart is able to process neurological signals independently of the brain. And the heart communicates with the psyche through the neuroendocrine immune system in a highly integrated way. In other words, emotions, if you will, will affect everything else. Okay, so, and if you'll also notice here in the last line, it says, <clears throat> the heart uh, communicates, in order to maintain homeostasis, which is your balance of the whole body, which with peculiarities specific to males and females, which only proves one thing, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. We've always known that, here's the proof. I hope somebody's laughing out there. Okay, so when you do get a cell danger response, it occurs, what happens is, is a cascade of changes, which I said in all the fancy stuff a while ago. There's changes in electron flow, which is your mitochondrial energy, uh, oxygen consumption, uh, the cell wall integrity, your availability of vitamins, and really important, your metal homeostasis. So normally, we get rid of metals that we're breathing through the air. If this occurs and it sticks, that's how we get heavy metal burden without being exposed to heavy metals directly. Now, when the danger's passed, and for you people in the UK, you all know Danger Mouse, <clears throat> I try and put some comedy in here so you'll giggle. Uh, there's a sequence of events that reverse the cell danger response, promote healing, and when the interference remo is removed, then the cell's function reboots. Now, we've all gotten like a strep throat when we were kids and so forth, where you had something where you just felt rubbish. <sighs> you know, the doctor gave you medicine and a couple of days later, you start feeling a bit better. But there's always that point where you, I'm um, turning the corner. Okay, you know you're going to get better and you start getting better rapidly. That's when the cell danger response has reversed and you're starting to heal, okay? But when there's chronic or multiple cell danger responses, you're gonna have numerous symptoms. And sadly, the healing mechanisms don't reboot because the negative effects on the healing mechanisms synergize. This is what Dr. Navio pointed out. And healing becomes impossible unless treating the root causes and the downstream effects. And here's where the divergence between allopathic and functional medicine thinking occurred. Okay, because there's a significant difference in the way you treat acute conditions and chronic conditions. Dr. Navio, in a, another paper that he wrote in 2018 called Metabolic Features and Regulation of the Healing Cycle, said when caring for acute disruptions of health, Careful identification of the trigger and so forth is a good part, is an important part of good medical care. However, dealing with chronic illness, treatments based on the rules of acute care medicine have proven less helpful and even caused harm by producing unwanted side effects. All that emphasis I put in. Okay. And to have an MD, PhD actually say this, I was not only flabbergasted, but I was very grateful because us, us alternative medicine practitioners have always known that. Okay, but we've never been able to prove it on a scientific basis. So what does this all create? What are we all talking about? Inflammation, 
Okay. And inflammation is not a term that you just go, that's it. Okay. No. Inflammation causes all the suffering we face. Okay. Inflammation will cause cardiovascular diseases, cancer, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, and so forth. It's the inflammation that kicks off the genetic predisposition. So that's how you know you have the inflammation. You wonder why does one person get this and another person get that? It's because of the genetic predisposition. Okay. So guess what? There's a great poster by LiveLoveFruit.com. How inflammation affects the body. And I show this to my patients and I show them the look in the brain. If you have inflammation, it can cause depression, autism, poor memory, Alzheimer's, and the liver, it can cause toxic load to build up and the thyroid, it can cause Hashimoto's or disruption in hormone functions. Why it affects the whole body. Why more one place primarily than another? That's a, you know, that depends on other factors. But chronic inflammation caused by a stuck cell danger response, which was caused by all those root causes we talked about, is how we got here. Now we have our choice. Do we go back and fix that and feed the body so and make sure that it has what it needs to run? Or do we treat the downstream effect? We treat the symptoms. Well, you really got to do both. But if you only do one, if you only treat the symptoms, what has caused it continues. If you get rid of the root cause and you've gotten past a certain point, then all those downstream effects remain and the person remains ill anyway. This is what happens with Lyme disease. Okay. You can wipe it because it's been chronic, you can wipe it out. But if the dysfunction from the Lyme disease remains, you don't see any symptom improvement, okay? Or, or you see symptom improvement and with the slightest amount of inflammation, up, you know, upregulation from a virus or something else, you're going to see the same symptoms that you think are Lyme. So the conclusion is Lyme is never, ever gone when it really is. So increases in inflammation have caused in our time frame a lot of cardiovascular issues, stomach issues, diabetes, metabolic disorders, adrenal fatigue, but the most, uh, the greatest target for chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is also known as chronic inflammation is in the nervous system. And this is why we have such a high amount of people with kids with autism, lots of anxiety out there, OCD, migraines, headaches, um, behavioral issues, dysautonomia, neuropathies, and all kinds of things, okay? It's from the chronic inflammation that has caused the imbalances, okay? Also in my bio, uh, individualized medicine, bio individualized medicine paradigm, we start looking at genetics. And <laughs> I wanted to make this very simple for everybody, okay? Because when you talk about genetics, you're always talking about SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms, genes, pathways, and everybody gets nuts. Well, I'll tell you why it gets nuts. If you look at this, this is the Roche biochemical pathways. The, the, um, the link is down below. This is an interactive PDF, okay? You want to lose your hair? Look, you want to lose your hair? Try and read through this thing, which I have, <laughs> okay, way back when. They're complex, and practitioners speak about genetics in this impenetrable code. Well, I'm going to demystify it for you. I'm going to decode it for you right now. When you talk about genetics, we're not talking about individual genes. The genes create an enzyme. Our body works by enzymes. Okay, so if you look at a different pathway, you'll see a bunch of genes there turned into enzymes. And what we talk about are polymorphisms or SNPs. And if it's green on most, um, on most uh, studies, it means that it's running normally. Okay, it will run normally, innately. If it's yellow or heterozygous, it will innately have 60% function. And if it's homozygous or red, it has innately 20% function. Why do I keep saying innately? What I mean is innately, which means that if it's, there's nothing else going on, that particular enzyme will work like that. But remember, you were born with these. So what's the big deal? Think of them as different uh, highways. One, the green being an eight-lane highway, heterozygous being a four-lane highway, homozygous being a two-lane highway. Or if you're in the UK, the green being an M-road, the yellow being a B-road, 
uh, and the red being a sea road. And I've been on your sea roads. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay. So the real problem here is that traffic slows down the pathways. So traffic is things like bacteria, heavy metals, viruses, parasites, food allergens, leaky gut syndrome causing inflammation, lack of substrate, lack of the stuff you need to go through it, lack of your vitamins and minerals, the presence of factors that will speed up or slow down the enzymatic activity. Obviously, if it's homozygous or a two-lane highway, it'll block up a whole lot quicker than um, heterozygous, which is a four-lane highway. But let me give you words of wisdom. The presence of a polymorphism or SNP does not mean you're ill. And the lack of a polymorphism does not mean you're well. So think about the eight lane highway. Do you think you can put enough traffic in there to slow it down? Yep. I get calls sometimes when people are reading about MTHFR, the dreaded MTHFR. And I get these calls saying, hi, 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 I just found out I'm Compound heterozygous MDHFR. I'm like, yes. But what do I do? I'm like, are you sick? No. Okay, you're not sick. You're born like this. Okay. These are things that give you a heads up. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how to think about genetics right now. Okay. Here's some words of wisdom. Genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls a trigger or lifestyle pulls a trigger. So what you're doing, what you're exposed to is what creates the problem not the innate genetic structure. You were born like that. There are very few things out there that make you become ill just when you're born, and we already know what they are. So nutritionists look at the pathways in a different way. In other words, how can we optimize their function? I'm going to use Dr. Ben Lynch's uh, earlier version of strategy, and what it's going to look like is you're going to see the gene um, or which creates the enzyme. And in um, green are the cofactors that you need to run it, the vitamins and minerals. Uh, in orange, it'll be things that increase activity, purples decrease activity. And of course, yellow and um, red for the homozygous and heterozygous. Okay. So this is a folate pathway, specifically my folate pathway. Okay, folate pathway starts with green leafy vegetables. And when the folate gets rendered by these various enzymes, it gets turned into dihydrofolate, tetrahydrofolate, and then a bunch of fancy names until it becomes this big, long 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate, where MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, reduces it to the active 5 methylfolate. Okay. So if you've got a lot of problems in here, you can give somebody 5-methylfolate, but that's not fixing anything. You're giving them the result of the pathway. What does this pathway need to work? Well, just a little consideration, okay? If you look through, you see NAD is necessary, NAD, 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 and then a lot of ATP, ATP, B6, magnesium, ATP. So what this pathway needs is absorbable folate, green leafy vegetables or whatever, Okay, B3, B2, B6, magnesium, zinc, SAM, okay? And most important, ATP, which is your energy, which comes from your mitochondria. Okay, things like folic acid, green tea, grapefruit seed extract, methotrexate, sulfur, will slow it down at this stage, okay? If we look at the cobalamin pathway, which is how you get your methylcobalamin or your methyl B12, the cobalamin, which is B12, enters in this, goes around to become methylcobalamin. And what you need here, zinc, SAM, B2, B3, okay? But what can slow it down? Nitrous oxide, lead, mercury, hydrogen peroxide, acid aldehyde, which you get from um, a lot of candida, uh, inflammation, and a lot of heavy metals. So when you're looking to optimize a pathway, you start thinking, okay, what does the body need to run this pathway? and make sure it gets it. Or you can just give somebody methylcobalamin and 5 methylfolate for the rest of their lives. You're not fixing anything. Okay, if I look at this as a catecholamine pathway, which is what the excitatory neurotransmitters are, and specifically it's mine. Okay, if I look at this pathway and look at the reds and yellows, I'm gonna to say to myself, gee, 
I'm going to have a little trouble breaking that down. Where's the backup going to be? Backup's going to be in dopamine. And high dopamine will give you excitation. It'll give you, can give you OCD, anxiety, so forth and so on. And very, very high will give you autism or schizophrenia. Okay. But when I look at this pathway, I'm saying, okay, well, how can I, how can I help somebody who's constantly with that? Well, first, I need to counterbalance. I need to support the other side, which is GABA and serotonin, and then support this pathway with what it needs to run, okay? But you also have to consider why this is expressing, because since I was born this way, why do I have symptoms? Okay, it wasn't the way I was born. It was whatever the environment did, and it's usually accumulative, okay? Think about histamine. Histamine is a biggie. You know, you start looking for the DAO enzymes and see if there's polymorphisms there, HNMT, because if you know the genetics, you can predict how histamine will break down. And histamine is necessary. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter, but it's also very necessary for life. But the histamine pathway, if I if there's a problem with DAO, I'm going to know how to intervene if somebody shows symptoms of histamine intolerance. Um, mast cell activation disorder, stuff like that, which is usually histamine intolerance. Or if I see a lot of uh, HNMT problems, I'll know how to intervene on the internal pathway. Okay. It's just a heads up. So let me give you an example how genetics really can be used. There was a study done in 2013, newborn screening for autism in search of candidate biomarkers. They wanted to identify newborns who were at risk for autism. Very laudable goal. So what they did was they got a bunch of, you know, however they did their studies, and they found out that if they had these groupings of biomarkers, that they met that may lead to, let's say, autoimmune, autoimmune targeting, gastrointestinal dysfunctions, decreased methionine metabolism, and these would give rise to autism because autism is pretty rampant. So the use of the epigenetics increases your index of suspicion of the pathways that would be compromised under an oxidative stress load. In other words, when you put that traffic in, where is the glitch going to happen? Okay. The benefit of this research is that it can point to possible dysfunctions and you can predict. So you might know how to feed your baby. You might not know whether your immunizations would be a bad idea. Um, and on the other side, if you have a child with autism, you can, there's several things you can look at that will decrease the inflammation in the brain and allow the cells to start working again. So you can prevent pathology and you can treat when there is pathology by knowing that it's just not a roll of the cosmic dice, that there are specific things that you could actually intervene. Here's the difficulty. In this particular um, abstract, it said diagnosis, diagnosis shortly after birth would be beneficial for the early initiation of treatment. <clears throat> the problem with that, and, and it's not done maliciously here, is that the presumption is, when you look at this, that you're born with autism. And although the entire paper refutes that premise, it's a commonly held belief. No one has been asking, well, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, autism was one in 5,000 births. I may be, I may be um, exaggerating a bit, but now it's getting close to one in 25 births. Why is that? And it's not better diagnosis. You don't have that kind of changes, okay? So the one glitch is the word diagnosis, okay? Diagnosis should be an estimate of the cause of a problem. So a sore throat is a symptom. A strep throat is a diagnosis. IBS is not a diagnosis. It's irritable bowel syndrome. Celiac disease, diagnosis. Hyperacidity, not a diagnosis. H. pylori induced gastritis, we know why now. So the symptoms are the effective root causes and diagnosis should be the root causes. So diagnosing an infant at birth with autism based on genetic polymorphisms may have the counterproductive effect of labeling the feeling that nothing can be done in today's thought pattern, and the parents may be dissuaded from making healthy choices for the child 
and preventing autism because they're being convinced that autism is a roll of the cosmic dice. So this particular study showed us that autism does have root causes as do all chronic illnesses. And you can have some predictive power, power if you know the genetics. And in so doing within their pathways, the SNPs provide a map for the clinician in either treatment or prevention, which is very cool. So just remember your genes are not your destiny. And if you understand the pathways, which is more the province of your uh, clinician, okay, you can utilize them to your best benefit. I have to caution you, there are programs out there that will go through your genetics and then tell you what to take, avoid them, okay? Anything that tells you exactly what you need is biased, okay? And trust me, I do this all day, every day, okay? There's no, everything has to be individualized. It's only one set of data. Okay, we also look at the NEI super system. This is where the differentiation went from linear to integrative thinking. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the little um, all the little spaces here, but I want you to let you know that neurology, immunology, and endocrinology are not separate systems. Okay, the neurological systems biomarkers are neurotransmitters. Okay, the endocrinology endocrinological system, which are your glands, their biomarkers are hormones, and the immune system's biomarkers are things called cytokines and chemo chemokines. So each system has their unique biomarkers, but each of the systems have the receptors for the other guy's biomarkers. But let me tell you a secret, you know why this is so cool? Because they're all talking to each other. Those three systems are consistently chattering like a bunch of kids, Cub Scouts in a tent. And I've been a Boy Scout leader since God's been a Boy Scout. Let me tell you something. If you, <laughs> there's no way of shutting shutting up Cub Scouts on a camping trip, you know, <laughs> they're like <laughs> they're constantly talking. Okay, and these three systems constantly talk to one another. And for those of you who require some scientific evidence, this neuroendocrine imbalances of the immune system by Taub and cellular immunology. Okay, and this again was in 2008 where there was substantial evidence now exists supporting the bidirectional communication between the neuroendocrine and the immune systems. And, and I can't see it up here. Okay, um, psychoneuroendocrine immunology, okay, in 2017 basically says that and proved that these communications between the mind, the body, the neurological system, the immune system, the endocrine system is a scientifically valid con um, concept. You know, we talk about psychosomatic diseases with disdain. Oh, that's psychosomatic. All that is is psycho of the mind affecting some of the body. And I always look at somebody and say, hey, have you ever heard of somatopsychic disease? Some of the body creating mood disorders. They're like, no, I'm like, sure you have, PMS. PMT, okay, isn't that mood disorder created by hormonal changes? Okay, isn't that the body creating problems in the mind? Okay, so if we realize that the neuroendocrine and immune systems talk to one another, and we know that they're affecting each other's system, we know that if one goes off, the others are gonna go off. Okay, and if we use the system as a whole, it takes away diagnosis and treatment from one system and puts it into a more multidisciplinary approach or a more holistic approach. So if you look at everything there, okay, you can start healing people because it's not the province of an endocrinologist. It's not the province of a neurologist. It's not the province of another three separate specialties. It should be the province of the practitioner who can put it all together. I like to call it a generalist, but nobody likes to be labeled as a generalist, but that's what we really need. Okay, and the last concept is the cell membrane integrity. You know, we talk about cell membranes as if they're just a membrane, okay? Whoop, the wrong way. Okay, but believe it or not, this is the most important thing in the body. Okay, because on a cell membrane are all your receptors, and it keeps wanting to do that, are all your receptors, they have different channels, 
Okay. Um, it's a semi-permeable membrane, keeping stuff in that's supposed to be in and keeping stuff out that's supposed to be out. Okay. It's, it helps you send messages through the body. It contains what you like to call transmembrane proteins, pumps, or channels. It contains the receptors for various biological functions. And it's how your immune system knows you from somebody else. So believe it or not, the master of the cell is more the cell membrane than it is the nucleus. Okay, if you have leaky membranes, it's going to affect all kinds of physiological processes. And we talk about leaky gut. Okay, and everybody says, ah, the heck is that? Well, guess what? It's a thing. Okay, and if you have leaky gut, which talks about cell membrane integrity, you can have leaky cells and you can have leaky brain. Hence the book that Elizabeth and I wrote. Okay, so here's an example for you. Uh, this is from um, Harvard. Uh, the link is down there. This is a this is a uh, video called ETC animation, and at the very beginning, you can see the uh, cell membranes, which are a phospholipid bilayer, and in this below it, which is um, an area that they have two membranes, you have this collection of protons. This particular complex is called ATP synthase. And how you create your energy is the protons actually go through here and turn it like a grist mill and produce these little guys up here, which is your actual energy. So you need these protons here in order to run this little grist mill. If the membrane becomes leaky, so to speak, what's going to happen is those protons are going to leak out because they're very high energy. And ATP synthase slows down and stops working, and the cell dies. Okay, so maintaining cell membrane integrity is something that the functional medicine practitioner concentrates on, because that's part of healing. And that's how you fix lots of chronic illnesses, okay? The most common form of cell membrane disintegrity is leaky gut syndrome, okay? What happens is that because of damage from xenobiotics, from antibodies, from drugs, from physical stress, infections, yada, 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 there's a breakdown of, this, of the barrier between the inside of the gut and the basement membrane. And what happens at first is those antigens get in and the immune system starts working on it and you start getting food allergies and intolerances. After a little while, you get multi-system abnormalities, and then it can progress to autoimmunity. This is all the amount of inflammation that's being built up over time, okay? And this has been shown, again, on a scientific basis for those people who like things a little more complex, okay? This is exactly how it works. You got to be careful with, uh, with uh, some of the treatments out there for leaky gut because if you understand the process of it, that the cell, uh, the connection between the cells just not pulled apart, it's actually uh, cells that are actually dying that separate it. Uh, if you understand how this process works, you can really help it. Okay, so I'm going to tell you in a little while how to fix leaky gut. But again, for those who are more scientifically minded amongst us, there is a gut brain axis, okay, showing how the microbiome influences anxiety and depression, okay? And this is where you're getting all the various probiotics these days that are showing that they can break down histamine better or the things called psychobiotics that will help mood and so forth. You know, the studies in here are getting pretty good where you can kind of target various and sundry uh, probiotics. But the fact is that you do need a good generalized microbiome for your health, that would be the takeaway, okay? So understand that chronic inflammation is what causes all problems, okay? And Dr. Navio in his original paper showed that degenerative disorders, neuropsychiatric disorders, autism, autoimmune diseases are all caused by cell danger responses that don't wanna go away, okay? Call them stuck, call them chronic, call them whatever you like. But once they get where they are, okay, your cells cannot heal, your mitochondria will not work, and you will get progressively ill, okay? So everybody's going to ask, how do you fix a leaky gut? Well, I wanted to do this because, sheesh, you know, like I said, I've been in practice a long time. 
And I take care of people who've been here, there, and everywhere. And, you know, that haven't gotten better. So often when I'm doing my history, which does take about an hour to have, okay, uh, I'll ask them, you know, have you, have you treated your leaky gut? If they bring it up and they'll say, I'll say, how did you treat it? Said, well, I took, I took probiotics. I said, okay, how did you treat the leaky gut? Leaky gut? I took probiotics. Okay, and like, and I wonder sometimes if it's the person reading or their practitioners just don't have the, the cohesive knowledge. Well, very, very simple. You want to fully digest your foods, okay? And after 35 years of age, most of us need digestive enzymes, okay? Uh, and reason is if you break down your foods completely, you'll absorb it. If you break down, let's say, proteins to not the constituent amino acids, but to short chain proteins, those are antigens and they get absorbed and the body responds to them like an antigen. So the addition of enzymes can cure a lot of stuff. It'll lower the antigen load, lower the inflammation. You need to create a mucus layer, okay? Mucus, as funky as it sounds, okay, is where the microbiome live. That's what they eat and that's where they do their work. It's your first layer of defense, okay? It's also, also where it traps antigens and secretory IgA comes over and grabs it and takes it away. You'll see things like fructooligosaccharides, slippery elm, inulin, chia seed, and so forth, galactooligosaccharides, xylitooligosaccharides, and human oligosaccharides. There are lots of different kinds out there, okay? The human oligosaccharides are hellishly expensive, uh, but for those people who are high allergic, it may be useful. But any of these things will help create a mucus layer. They're also under the classification of demulcent herbs. You have to give the body what it needs to repair the cells, okay? And a lot of times you need butyrate, zinc carnosine, glutamine, and um, the SBI is serum-derived bovine aminoglobulin isolates. I have another slide just on that. The thing I would say to be careful about is that if you have anxiety problems or excitation problems, be careful with the glutamine, okay? Because a lot of glutamine is gonna create glutamate. And if you're having trouble converting it to GABA, which is how you calm yourself, you're gonna have more excitation. So sometimes you have to do it separately. And then we need a probiotic to reestablish the adequate diversity. And that's a seminar in and of itself. Um, there was something that we use called leaky gut mucosal butter, okay? This has been shown to fix leaky gut comparatively quickly. When I say quickly, I mean three to six months, not a year and a half. It's a self-blended product, okay? And believe it or not, you can use it. It's very well tolerated by almost everybody, okay? So anybody who has chronic inflammation, believe it or not, this is the best thing to use. I'm going to tell you exactly how to make it. Okay, so uh, extra virgin olive oil, half cup. If you're not dairy sensitive, organic salted butter, a uh, quarter of a cup, suggest you melt it. If you are dairy sensitive, maybe a quarter cup of coconut, almond, hemp seed, any of the cold pressed oils. Unpasteurized natural honey, two tablespoons. And, and a lot of people out there saying, what does this mean? At the end of the seminar, at the end of the webinar, there's a, a list of scientific evidence of all the different things I'm talking about here. Um, probiotics, maybe five capsules of it. Zinc carnosine, I usually use single uh, Seeking Health or Pure Encapsulations, four capsules of that. A uh, product called Cialex, which is sialic acid, uh, which is act as a mucin. Okay, four capsules of that. Uh, butyrate is super important, but if you try and put powdered butyrate in, oh my God, the smell. There is a liquid butyrate out there that from pure encapsulations that works very well and doesn't smell bad. And if you are going to use glutamine, about four scoops, okay? But remember, if you have any kind of excitation, it's probably not a good idea. If you have a test that shows you have low secretory IgA or you've been ill for a long time, add in serum-derived bovine immunoglobulin isolates. Um, that's sold as SBI. Uh, uh, hmm slipping my mind. But anyway, the studies that were done on the serum derived bovine immunoglobulin isolates show that even people with HIV, this will help their gut to work better. So essentially what you do is you can put all the stuff 
in a blender, blend it up, okay, uh, for a couple of minutes, put it in a jar, and put it in the refrigerator. And by morning, you've got a toast. I mean, a, <laughs> a butter. You might want to mix it a couple of times while it's congealing. And you can take a tablespoon of that a day, okay? And guess what? Your gut will start healing. Uh, I wanted to go through neurotransmitters in a big way because I am the neurotransmitter whisperer. But I think I'm going to ask if I could come back and do a lecture on neurotransmitters and mood disorders because this was getting into a lot of slides, okay? But functional medicine practitioners do test for neurotransmitters. I know there's arguments about it, but uh, I will tell you that they're accurate, especially if you look at it from a biomarker point of view. So just real quick, uh, neurotransmitters are divided into excitatory and inhibitory. Uh, this is a, a great thing called the brain wall that my son and I, my son is a, graphic artist uh, created, uh, which is color coded and tells you what areas of the brain do what and who's responsible for it. And you can go to my website and um, or my YouTube channel and look up the neurotransmitter um, lectures I've done and it'll be on there. Excitatory neurotransmitters have to be in balance uh, because even epinephrine, if you have too little, too much, you're gonna have nasty symptoms and especially dopamine. Dopamine is a funny neurotransmitter. Uh, I mean, funny, strange, not funny, haha. When it's too low, you can get a really nasty depression called that he hedonism or anhedonism, which is a lack of joy. But when it gets too high, you can actually get paranoia, psychosis, um, and other nasty things. Glutamate that we were talking about before, when it gets too high, you can start getting seizures. Okay. A lot of times uh, people with attention disorders, okay, uh, there's two reasons for attention disorders, a lack of phenylethylamine and norepinephrine, which are re responsible for focus, or your brain is moving so fast that you have the attention span of a gnat. You got to figure out which one. And that's why things like amphetamines work for some and not for others. Okay. The inhibitory neurotransmitters simply calm everything down. Okay, serotonin is the one we know the most of. And if you have it too high, though, hot flashes, serotonin syndrome, irritability, too low, anxiety, insomnia, depression, uncontrolled appetite, usually for sugar and carbs. Uh, there was a book called Potatoes for Prozac. Okay, so somebody who has a um, craving for chips or that's in the UK or French fries in the, in the US, or they're usually looking for serotonin. Whereas, whereas if they're craving sugars, cookies, candy, they're feeding candida. And since serotonin is the primary neurotransmitter of the enteric nervous system, a lot of times if you're trying to fix a gut, you need to support the serotonin pathway. I would really love to do a long masterclass on, on neurotransmitters. So anyway, how about we put this together with a couple of case studies? Everybody game? All right, let's see. Uh, this case study is Alyssa. I have permission to speak her name, okay? Um, when Alyssa was eight years old, her mother contacted me because uh, she thought she needed Erlen glasses. And I asked a bunch of questions. She said she had a bad gut upon eating gluten, soy, or almost anything else. But after questioning, and I had her mother question her that night, I found out that the poor little one had auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, and olfactory hallucinations. And really, I said to her mother, I said, get a workup done. She said, what workup? I said, listen, you got to get CAT scans, all this good stuff, because sometimes conditions are best treated by other specialists. So her workup at the time, she did a brain CT, MRI, labs for thyroid, and so forth so forth, everything was, came back negative. And the thought was, hey, she's having hallucinations. Let's start putting her eye into psychotics. No. So this kind of condition, there's a lot of possibilities. So I started looking at her genetic information. Okay, and we already talked about why. And here it was at the time, Strategine was not uh, invented. 
okay? Um, actually, the original strategy was my idea that I shared with Dr. Ben Lynch, and this is how I shared it with him, okay? So in this particular case, I showed where in the pathway planners, how, just like mine, her COMT and MAO would back up her dopamine, okay? Her GAD enzyme, that one that takes glutamine and turns into GABA, was significantly polymorphic. And my suspicion was she had a lot of glutamate because a lot of times hallucinations are really a seizure activity. B6 is the cofactor. Okay, for those people who may not know, abnormalities in the GABA system have been noted in subjects with mood and anxiety disorders. Um, her ability to break down reactive oxygen species was compromised. So whatever kicked that up may have had um, major difficulties. Uh, difficulty in creating methyl B12 and BHMT creates homocysteine, but here's a little clinical pearl for the practitioners. When you see something like this and somebody has chronic dysthymia or um, trauma, okay, um, a EMDR, which is a type of um, therapy, usually works pretty well with them. Okay, transsulfuration wasn't so bad. This is how you create glutathione, and then the glutathione needs to be recycled, okay? Um, she has a tendency to have high levels of immunoglobulins when she has leaky gut, which she did, okay? And her methylation pathway was significantly compromised. By the way, MTHFR, they usually look at C677T and 1298C. There are 50... MTHFR genes. This one has about 13 or 14. So you can look at it and say, well, this pathway is going to have some difficulties. Okay. When you only have two, it's hard to tell. And when methylation is interfered with, you can have a lot of psychiatric illness. Uh, the mitochondria, if you should have difficulty in the first complex, which is this NDUFS, and difficulty with recycling glutathione, um, the amount of oxidized glutathione will block the entry of what goes in here. Okay, I'm, that's as like simple as I can make it. So when I was thinking about it at the time, I said, well, she has hallucinations. Here's her SNPs. And my index of suspicion was immune issues, microbial involvement, the downstream effects with neurotransmitter imbalances, and what questions I needed to ask her, what testing I needed to do, um, the bad gut, again, leaky gut, upregulation of the immune system, dysautonomia, relationship of the systems, her symptoms to food intake, which she already had, and food allergy tests, organic acid tests, and cross-reactivity testing. Um, again, mitochondrial function, what the suspicion was, what the downstream effects might be, ask about fatigue, lack of ability to heal, which in the fact, she was a little girl that wasn't very energetic, okay? and what testing I could do at the time, and methylation we already talked about. So this uh, panel, if you get to see it, is something to kind of look at and say, how did you look at this differently to help heal her, okay? So my suspicion was she had neurotransmitter problems, leaky gut syndrome, difficulty with aldehyde metabolism, methylation issues, and mitochondrial dysfunction. And how do you use this information? Well, you take a good history, uh, you can work things empirically, but you want to do some testing, okay? So we wanted to search for the root causes. This is a neurotransmitter test, okay? Just so you know, 20 to 80 is considered normal here. This particular pattern where the glutamate is high, dopamine is high, dopac, uh, norepinephrine, this is an immune problem with um, semi-advanced decompensation. Okay, so she's had it when she first got whatever she had. All these things were way up here, and they're all on their way down. I teach a course called Dynamic Neurotransmitter Assessment. And with a history, you can tell which direction these are going in. Okay, so the hallucinations were from overexcitation, too much dopamine. Okay, so hmm, the adrenal fatigue, given this indicator, one high, one low. It's been around for at least three or four years. So you need to ask, okay, who 
upregulated or who dysregulated the nervous system. Okay. Leaky gut syndrome will do that just by virtue of the fact of creating a lot of inflammation. And we have to start looking for microbial involvement. I tested her for Lyme disease. Okay. Lyme disease testing can be very, very dicey. Okay. Uh, this particular lab, not only did they give me the CDC and alternative criteria, positive or negative, they actually showed me the test. And the test, um, just so you know, what is considered positive. If at this time, if these numbers are 60 or more, then the band would be considered positive. So positive, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, positive, um, equivocal or, or positive. The problem is, is when you use regular labs, if all of these numbers are below 60, and let's say all of them, you know, show something, it says negative, but why would you be developing antibodies to Lyme disease, uh, even though they're on the lower side, if it weren't there, okay? Same thing here, and you have IgG and IgM, we're not going to get into that argument, okay, where there was no antibodies, but the 23 band had antibodies that were below what would be considered positive. This is just a repeat of um, the neurotransmitters. So my real suspicion was she had chronic Lyme disease, plus she was from Texas. Can Lyme disease cause those symptoms? Yeah. Okay, so we found, we did a lot of testing. And we found that she had candida yeast. She had um, HHV6, which is a herpes virus in the brain. Uh, she had Lyme disease and a bunch, of neuro, a bunch of food allergies, okay? So my working diagnosis that was Lyme disease, yeast overgrowth, leaky gut syndrome, and viral syndrome. And what you do at this point is say to yourself, okay, can the leaky gut lead to immune dysregulation that gives you that can be a cause of the neurotransmitter imbalances or hallucination. Yep. Can Lyme and HHV6 attack the neural cells and create the problem? Yep. Can yeast overgrowth increase the levels of basically formaldehyde? Yep. So you get those things together and you say to yourself, you know, if I treat these, maybe I can get rid of the problem. So Sherlock Holmes would always say, if you've ruled out the impossible, whatever's left, however improbable, must be the truth. Remember something, <clears throat> if you tell this little girl she's got schizophrenia, she's gonna be on medicines for the rest of her life and the process that got her there will continue. Because once you make a diagnosis, the investigation stops. If I look at her and say, listen, you know, all this stuff that's been going on with you, it's because you've got really bad leaky gut, you've got Lyme disease, you've got you know a, a viral syndrome, you've got yeast overgrowth, and all that's gonna happen with her and her mother is say, what do we do about it? Okay, so this is what we did. Um, by the way, for those people who like to be really technical, you can understand physiology down to the quantum level, but you can only intervene at the global level. So it's real nice that you can understand down, way down, but guess what? You can only intervene at a larger global level, and that's where foundational treatment came from. Okay, so what we want to do is lessen the traffic. This was dietary restrictions like getting her off gluten and stuff, like things that she was allergic to. Okay, starting the process of cellular and gastrointestinal repair. So I'm not going to go through the uh, what we just did before, but with leaky gut, but uh, put her on digestive enzymes. We put her on herbs. At the time, we didn't have that um, leaky mucosal gut butter. Uh, put her on phospholipids to support, support um, cellular repair. Put her on digestive enzymes. Gave her the DAO enzyme to help break down um, histamine probiotics, and absorbable vitamins and minerals. When I say absorbable, I typically use liposomal. Okay, that's just as, that will get in, okay? Now, after a little while, she was starting to get better, but everything was still, you know, it, it was better, but not great. So the I was co-treating with an um, integrative pediatrician. And after the GI repair program, the pediatrician wanted to put a PICC line into her and start doing rotating intravenous antibiotics. Um, I found another way of treating it uh, and I offered it to the parents, the pros and cons. 
and it decided to go in that direction. And it took uh, six weeks and all of her symptoms were gone. And in three months, we retested and everything was negative. So the sleuthing was worth it. Okay. This is my Alyssa. She's so cute. Okay. At eight years old. And I kept in touch. This is her at 12, 16. Okay. And she's now in college. Look at that face. Okay. She's an honor student, a star athlete. She's there on, on um, yeah. What do they call that when, uh, <clears throat> when you, um, college is paid for because you're an athlete. Okay. She's a beautiful young woman. I know the family. Okay. And basically her hallucinations were an expression of the genetic predisposition were an expression of the genetic predisposition caused by neural excitation and immune upregulation secondary to infections and leaky gut syndrome, all kept going by chronic cell danger response. A mouthful, I realize, but look at what we did. And this is by no means an odd case. Okay, this is something I do all the time. And my colleagues do all the time. And this is worth it. Second, Chelsea, this was a very, very, very difficult case. Chelsea started with febrile seizures when she was 10 months old. I'm not going to read all of this. I just want you to notice that in 1994, she had four seizures in three years. And over time, she developed more and more and more seizures. By the time 2006 rolled around, she was having seizures not related to fevers. And she was being treated and appropriately with the various medications that are usually utilized. She'd had M MRIs, nothing was working. Okay, as the years went along, the number of seizures increased to the point that she was getting like 100 or 200 seizures a year. This is a lot, okay? They tested her for the C6717, 1298C as if that made a whole lot of difference. Okay, they did food allergy testing. They tried a lot of different things, but nobody was putting it together. And the thought was, she's going to be like this for the rest of her life. Well, I don't know if you have, you can hear this, but let me show you what we were fighting. This is Chelsea having a seizure. Okay, that's her, that's her service dog, cutest thing on four legs. And this happened 25 times a month. By the way, the parents were phenomenal. Okay. And I'm kind of glad the sound's not on because it's, it's scary. All right. Think about it. This kind of condition, what's it doing to her brain? It's like lightning going through. Okay. So um, from April of 2019 to uh, March of 2020, you can see that the seizures kept going up. Okay, and I got involved, I believe, um, the beginning of 2021. And I'll say in a second. But I looked at a genetics, okay, and what I did was just make this very clear because I used two different um, tests. And you can see that she had a genetic predisposition to excitation. Okay, well, guess what? That doesn't tell me what's causing it, okay? And she had a genetic predisposition to high histamine. Okay, so I knew I had to break down histamine. Histamine will rip open the cells. Okay, it is one of those things that's important for neurotransmitted neurotransmission, is important for a lot of things, but when it's dysregulated, it can cause a lot of nasty, nasty symptoms. Okay, I looked at her um, hair elements. Okay, she had a high uranium. I've seen a lot of people with this. Uh, high lead. Okay. And she had a reasonable amount of minerals. By the way, if you're doing hair analysis, you're kind of seeing six weeks because what you're seeing, what's being excreted. If you're doing uh, metal testing for the serum, it's recent. If you're doing metal testing for the art, for the red blood cells is approximately three month window and the white blood cells approximately six months. Okay. This is um, Chelsea's food allergy testing. Notice that the white lines are IgG and the red and the black lines are IgE. IgE is where you get 
histamine. Okay. When you have a bunch of things up like this, that's mainly leaky gut. Okay. Whatever you're eating, you're seeing. Um, sorry for the tilt here. Okay. Where was she getting her histamine? Well, dairy was kind of nasty for her as was beef, lamb, and pork. Okay. That was giving you a lot of IgE. And this is where the histamine was coming from. Okay. Uh, looking at other tests, her iron was on the higher side, as was the transferrin. A lot of times viral infections will kick up the iron metabolism. Okay. And um, that's a fairly new thing that's on the, you know, this was from 2008, but we're beginning to see that with the COVID patients now, how it affects the mitochondria and actually makes them burst. Okay. By 2019, she was having still a lot of seizures, but uh, this is what you would see with Chelsea. She was very confused. I don't know if you can hear her talking. Sort of walking around like she's making dancing movements, movements sometimes. Not exactly all there. Okay. Uh, so from February 2020 to February 2021, when I was involved, her seizures went from 22 a month to four a month. Okay. And what I did was the foundational treatment using liposomal vitamins and minerals, treated her for leaky gut syndrome, supported the mitochondria, supported the cell membranes a lot because let's face it, guys, you know, those seizures were ripping that stuff apart. Uh, she progressed slowly. A lot of times it takes time. And the hundreds or thousands of seizures made significant damage to her central nervous system. There was no single root cause that I could find. As a matter of fact, I brought this case to my, um, my advanced practitioner group that is, uh, meets fortnightly. And they helped me with, a, with some of the points of view and also made some suggestions for treatment that actually accelerated her healing. So I want to give a shout out to my group and thank them again. Um, but sometimes if you don't know what's going on, what you should be doing is getting the cells and biochemical pathways optimized vitamins and minerals that get absorbed into the cells. Make sure you're getting phospholipids in. All the things you would do to make sure a cell works. So in mid-2021, this is Chelsea playing cards. You notice you shall be, still be shaking. But she's able to think. As the seizures decreased in number, she started healing. If she didn't have what she needed to heal, she wouldn't have. And in late 2021, I got this great movie. Hi. And I think you can see that she's pretty well with it now. Okay, this has taken two years. Okay, and this is Chelsea, she's 27 now. And she is one beautiful girl. One of the earlier meetings I had with the parents and they were always there. Uh, Chelsea was sitting there and said, you have really pretty eyes. And she went like this, looked right, uh, you know, and I knew she was in there. Okay, and these parents were incredibly dedicated. So I got this card from them. Okay, last Christmas. And um, I cried for about a week <laughs> because it makes it all worth it. So the fact is, people, if we think differently and work together, we can change lives. We can change a lot of lives. But it does take a combined effort. So as I promised, tips on how to pick out a practitioner. <sighs> Here's some words of wisdom. Listen to your patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. So William Osler one of the founding fathers of uh, Johns Hopkins Medical Center said that in 1895. So my joke here is that in real estate, it's location, location, location. In healthcare, it's history, history, history. You wanna find out what's wrong? You need to take a history. 
And you got to treat the patient, not the test. So when you're looking for a practitioner, you kind of want to get go on that reputation. So here's how you can pick out a good practitioner, uh, alternative medicine practitioner, okay? Uh, because a lot of this complex stuff you can't do by yourself. If they have certification beyond their original degrees, if they have an eclectic knowledge base, okay? So you're given true holistic care. In other words, as soon as they're disparaging the other side, in other words, if they're not willing to work with allopathic medicine or they don't have enough experience and they're stuck in their little paradigm, that's where there's problems, okay? Uh, if they're focused on finding the root causes and all the downstream effects creating and will create an individualized manner of treating you, not your condition. The real trick here, guys, is that they have to treat you, which is your attitudes and kind of coach you through everything and not your condition. You are not your condition, okay? They have to use lab tests appropriately and know how to interpret, not just read them. Anybody can read a test. The company show you what the test means but a good practitioner knows how to put it together and knows how to target testing. Because let me tell you something, testing can be very expensive if you're paying for it. And throwing out a net and seeing what you catch is not usually the way to do it. You have to target it. And they'll take the time to listen to you and explain things to you. So I really suggest that you interview any practitioner before committing yourself to their care. And what are you doing in the interview? You want to make sure, assure yourself that he or she is committed to your healing, as committed to your healing, and are willing to take the time and effort to return you to life. Okay? And that's super important. Because chronic illnesses do take a long time to heal. A magic pill does not work, does not exist. If you're still looking for the magic pill, I'm sorry to say, you're going to be stuck for a long time. So you need to work with a practitioner, embrace the healing process, participate in your recovery, and you will heal. You will. I've got so many cases that nobody said would heal and they are. Okay. Here's some resources for you. Uh, for the nutritionists who work with the LDN Research Trust, who are all the kind of practitioners that I just mentioned, this is the link for them. Uh, if you're looking for a very simple book, which is the one that i um, Elizabeth and I wrote, which is called Leaky Gut, Leaky Cells, Leaky Brain. It's available on Amazon for Kindle, and you can get the book. It's also available in Japan. For the testing for the practitioners, if you're in the United States, Rupa Health is the best way to go because Rupa Health has all the various companies under their roof. So for the same prices, you can you don't have to go to 14 other companies. You can have it all in one place and they'll do all the work. In the UK and EU, you can um, access functional diagnostic, uh, functional um, diagnostic, which is uh, Jonathan uh, Cohen's. Um, this has all wonderful, wonderful functional testing. Uh, and the program it goes through is phenomenal in its explanations. Uh, you can go to BioLab uh, UK or Regenerous Labs. Okay, and all these air, these guys will work in the UK and the EU. Uh, there are places in Australia. Anybody can contact me at any time if they need help, any practitioner to um, figure out where to get testing or how to interpret it. These are some evidence-based re uh, references that I promised you before. Um, whoa, there it is. By the way, this stuff is, doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be exceptionally difficult. You can learn this stuff by going to YouTube and going to science music videos. And uh, <laughs> the teacher that does this, I swear I learned a lot of this stuff just by listening to him. Okay. So you might want to, you know, if you kind of got confused as to what an enzyme does or what the heck am I talking about? Okay. They have music videos that are incredibly simple and accurate. Okay. Um, again, I'm Dr. Jess Armine. I do treat patients and I mentor practitioners throughout the world. Uh, I do offer prospective uh, patients a complimentary 30-minute get acquainted session. They just have to go to my website so they can interview me. And the House Armine Heal the Sick, Feed the Hungry, Shelter the Weak, and Defend, uh, I'm sorry, Shelter the Weary, and Defend the Weak was my Father's Day present from my graphic artist son. So 
Thank you for letting me babble in your direction. And I'm going to be really happy to answer your questions now. Okay. So what is this doing in integrative and functional medicine? Nothing. Okay. Integrative uh, functional medicine, think of them, think of it as the alternative medicine practitioner. What I would really like to see is an integrative medicine center. Now, not one person, not one professional can be integrative. They like to think so. But if you've been an MD or you have an allopathic background, you're going to tend to think that way. It actually takes a blending, which is going to take more than one practitioner. So that's what I was alluding to. Do you have any suggestions for increasing serotonin and norepinephrine to help with chronic pain without taking an SNRI? Sure. If you want to increase serotonin, you can either use L-tryptophan or 5-hydroxytryptophan. Now, here's something that you have to be careful about. Um, L-tryptophan, if there's a lot of inflammation, which if you have a lot of pain, you do, okay, can get pulled into a different pathway called the IDO pathway, don't worry about the words, and create something called quinolinic acid, which is a hell of an excitotoxin. So 5-hydroxytryptophan is a little further down the pathway and goes directly to create serotonin. Now, if you're going to do that, I'm going to suggest very strongly that you start slow, like at 50 milligrams a day, and then work your way up slowly. Uh, and you can increase your serotonin that way, okay? Norepinephrine in that pathway, the pathway looks like this. Phenylalanine to tyrosine to L-dopa, dopamine. And that creates dopamine, which then gets broken down to norepinephrine, then epinephrine. The critical enzyme that does that is dopamine beta hydroxylase. Uh, and you need PQQ, vitamin C, and copper to run that. Okay, so if you're going to if you're going to raise norepinephrine, okay, and, and I don't know why you'd want to do that specifically, okay, but if that's what you want to do, the best way to do it would be with tyrosine. Most people use about 500 milligrams a day, um, but it's really helpful if you get your neurotransmitters tested so that you know where the balance is. Okay, chronic pain can have a lot of sources. Okay, a lot of sources. And you might want to take my little hint about leaky gut because that's going to cut down inflammation big time. Pain is always inflammation, but that's the way you do it if you were, you know, going to go back about the way you asked. Can we receive a copy of the slides? Yeah, of course. All right. Okay, the substitute for honey for someone who's allergic to honey, just leave it out of the recipe. Okay, honey does have a bunch of uh, healing qualities. Okay, but if you're allergic to honey for whatever reason, it, it's not critical. Okay, that's the nice thing about that, you know, le leaky gut mucosal butter is that you, there's a lot of variations you can put in. Okay, so just leave it out. It's not a critical component uh, and you'll still get benefit from it. I guarantee it. That's it. Do you use palmitoethanolamide? Yes, I do. Uh, palmitoethanolamide, PEA, if I'm pronouncing it right, took me about three weeks to get to pronounce it, is an anti-inflammatory that's fat soluble that works differently than other anti-inflammatories. And it works very, very well. Uh, I usually recommend 400 milligrams three times a day. It's also available everywhere, okay? It does take a little time to work, but it works very, very, very well. Again, like anything else, you know, if it's not helping, then you have to critically look at it and say, okay, what is this treating? Okay, and if it's not hitting the, you got to look at something else, sort of like taking LDN, which works with the toll-like receptors. It's not for everybody. All that means is that where your inflammation is coming from may not be from that area. So, or when I'm, when I'm chelating heavy metals, especially mercury, I'll always tell people, look, if mercury is the big deal here, you're going to see wonderful improvements. If it's only part of it, you're going to see partial improvement. If there's none, there's going to be none. Okay, so... I've had very good, good experiences with it. The light thing I like about PEA is that it does not, it's not one of those things that can hurt somebody. Okay, can you talk about how you would approach trying to reverse central sensitization? Um, I'd like you to explain central sensitization for me. If you could do that so I can answer that specifically. So does it matter if one has a slower fast COMT to contribute to the slow breakdown of glutamine into GABA? Not really, okay? 
I know Dr. Ben has changed it from homozygous to heterozygous and what's slow and what's fast and so forth. Uh, the whole thing is you have to realize that you were born like that. So it doesn't matter whether it's slow or fast, you still have to do the same thing. You still have to supply the cofactors, look at why uh, you're not breaking glutamine, glutamate into GABA, which is usually B6, by the way, okay? Because CO, COMT doesn't enter into that pathway. Uh, but downstream of that, it will. So your short answer is using B6 or P5P and look at your sources of glutamine. Like if you're trying to heal your leaky gut and you're, you're pumping in four to seven grams of, of glutamine a day, stop, okay? Use something else, all right? Like this serum-derived bovine amine list, that will help a lot better. So honestly, uh, I would just think about B6 or P5P. Is there a place to further research the risks of L-glutamine for leaky gut? How long am I most you suggest taking this? Well, the re you don't really have to research. You can just do, uh, you can if you want. All right, L-glutamine creates glutamate. All right, glutamate is a very excitotoxic compound. All right, when it's too high, you'll get seizures. If you're taking glutamine and you feel worse, there it is staring at you in the nostrils. Now you could add B6 to see if it'll help the pathway work. And if it doesn't, I would abandon the project and go about fixing the leaky gut a different way. All right. How long would I use it? Well, how long would you use? Yeah, I'm sorry, if I'm reading this right, is there a place to further research the risk of L-glutamine for leaky gut anxiety? If it's causing anxiety, just stop, please. Okay, because you're adding to the problems. All right. You can, um, there are GABA supplements out there. The better ones that are available would be from Quicksilver Scientific, which is a liposomal GABA, which we'll get into the brain very quickly. Uh, the problem with benzodiazepines and stuff is that um, they will stimulate the GABA A receptor and that's where damage occurs. So if you can give somebody GABA that just gets into their brain, then they'll have GABA to use while you're fixing the physiology. Okay. And um, when you say how long at most would you suggest taking this? Are you saying, are you asking about the glutamine? I hope I'm asking, I hope I'm answering the question correctly or to, you know, I hope I'm asking the question that is being asked. Okay. Uh, if, and let me just bullet point it. If you're taking L-glutamine and you're getting anxiety, stop. It's not that critical. Okay. There are other ways of fixing the gut. If you're taking L-glutamine and you insist on continuing to take it, then take B6 with it to make sure to, because that's the cofactor for that enzyme. If you're still having anxiety, please stop. Okay. I'd rather you not take glutamine and then take something else for the anxiety. I would stop the glutamine. Okay. Look at the leaky gut um, ingredients. Just leave out the glutamine. There's plenty in there to, to fix the leaky gut. And glutamine by itself should not be used to fix the leaky gut. There are many other parameters. Okay. So I hope I um, answered that. Okay. Done. I hit the done button, right? 5-HTP is very difficult for people with COMT SNPs. Any other suggestions? Um, I, well, let's not get into um, what causes what. The fact is that 5-HTP can be difficult for people if you use high amounts. And the reason for it is that the serotonin receptors tend to be atrophied. So you have to tease them up a little bit. And that's why I use 50 milligrams a day for a week or two and then 100 milligrams a day and so forth. Now, if you can't use the 5-HTP at all, then the only other choice is to use L-tryptophan, okay? And yes, I know it might go down the other pathway, but simultaneously while you're treating somebody, you should be working on their leaky gut or working on the inflammation. As the inflammation drops, it's not going to be stolen or pulled into that other pathway. Okay. Just know that L-tryptophan, only about 10 or 15% of it becomes 5-HTP, which actually works for some people because they, they get their serotonin a bit slower. Okay. Submitted my saliva to Sharjean. Do you know, do you interpret these? Yeah. Um, well, I, 
I interpret the um, <laughs> the strategy and test, and you could just contact my office and make an appointment for that. What's the best way to go about learning interpreting? <laughs> You might want to call, if you're a practitioner, you might want to call me and I'll, um, or contact me and I'll chat with you about it because it's not as hard and it's not as easy. You know, it's a matter of, it's a matter of uh, learning how the pathways work. Okay. I'd be happy. That would be another two, three hours of explanation. I'm not trying to avoid you just, you know, you might want to just have me interpret yours, you know, and I'll show you how to think about it. Because once you know how to think about it, it's easy. Do you suggest a specific probiotic? Do you recommend strategy or the specific testing? Okay. I don't, my recommendation for probiotics is individualized to my patient's needs. Okay. Uh, that's the benefit of knowing the different probiotics. When I don't have a particular, if somebody says, gee, uh, what's kind of a good general probiotic? I like something that has a lot of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. One of the better probiotics out there. Uh, all the probiotics made by Seeking Health are wonderful. Okay, uh, I do tend to use Megaspore Biotic. Okay, um, for some reason it, it roots better, um, but it all depends on the individual. Strategy and other specific genetic tests and understand the pathways. Strategine is the better one to use because they put the polymorphisms into the pathways. It's a little complex to look at, but if you take your time, it's easy. There are other, te there are other tests out there. They don't put it together uh, and they don't put it together in the pathways. So you don't have a good feeling for you know, what actually is going on, which I know stinks. Uh, and the ones uh, like Tree of Life, no, I shouldn't say it, um, that point directly to product, you have to be very suspicious of because the information is being geared towards selling products. So they're going to skew the data. Okay. And I, I, I detest that. Uh, Strategy is your better, better middle ground. Okay. Uh, MTHFRsupport.com has a wonderful report with about 1,100 genes, but you really have to understand where they go and what they do. Otherwise, it's going to be incredibly confusing. And I realize strategy is a bit on the pricey side, but it's worth it. Which neurotransmitter test do you prefer and why? I always love this question. Okay. <clears throat> understand that neurotransmitter testing, be it urine, serum, platelet is all not CNS, central nervous system. It's going to be a combination of central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and whatever. So whatever test you use, and I tend to use urinary um, neurotransmitters, okay, are to be utilized as biomarkers. In other words, looking at the pattern. Looking at the pattern will give you an idea of what that patient may need, whether you're using nutraceuticals or pharmaceuticals. Okay, if the person has very little serotonin and everything else is, you know, like the dopamine's on the higher side, well, you're going to want to raise serotonin to bring down the dopamine because they counterbalance one another. Whether you do that with tryptophan or 5 hydroxy tryptophan or an SSRI, you know, that's, that's part of your practice. Um, there's loads of uh, companies out there that do neurotransmitter testing. I tend to use Vibrant Labs. Uh, they're neurotransmitter advanced. Uh, because it has the cortisol and not only the neurotransmitters, but the, uh, met the metabolites. Okay. Again, feel free to call me and I can answer that in a, um, in a more uh, complete manner. I've taken care of a, have I seen many mass cell activation clients? Yeah. You know, and it is on the rise. And one of my theories is that it's the environmental toxins that's um, dysregulating the cell membranes of the cells plus the mast cells. So they tend to degranulate with very little, you know, impetus. So in, in order to fill, to hold on, in order to fix mast cell activation disorder, you do the same thing as fixing the other cells, okay? Which is roughly fixing 
the leaky gut because whatever's going into the gut, it's not just fixing the gut, it's fixing all the other cells also. And it, it is on the rise. Uh, mastocytosis is uh, not mast cell activation disorder, but okay. Uh, but a lot of the histamine issues, if you look at the genetics, you can help your, you can help by looking whether they just need DAO, if they need support histamine, the external pathway outside the cell, DAO, aldehyde dehydrogenase, and then it goes out as acetic acid. The internal is HNMT, MAO, A and B, and then um, the aldehyde dehydrogenase is an out. So um, Seeking Health has a product called Histamine Block Plus. If you were going to shotgun, that has all the cofactors and everything you need for both pathways. But it is on the rise. And if you just do that, you'll help the breakdown of histamine, but you're not going to do much for the mast cell activation disorder. So you have to kind of back up and say, why is this happening? I have Hashimoto's and on LDN, which has helped me great, get great sleep, but I have hair loss, possibly alopecia. What might it take? Well, I don't think LDN by itself causes hair loss. I think you have something else going on. You know something, if your inflammation is dropping, uh, most probably you should look at the trace minerals. Okay, trace mineral lack will cause hair loss. Okay, especially in a woman. Okay, thyroid. You have to look at the other parameters also. Okay, LDN is wonderful, and you're doing. And if you're doing well on it, that's great. But like anything else, it's not a panacea. Okay, you have to look at the whole person. Kimberly. Okay. Do you treat patients with individual epistemal vitamins and minerals, or are they a combination product? The combination product is called Protovite, P-R-O-D-O-V-I-T-E. It is made by Victory Nutrition International. Looks like that. <laughs> okay. And it is a concentrated um, multivitamin, multimineral with uh, proligna, which resets receptors, encased in a liposome called a protosome, which is the strongest on the planet. And I've been using it for decades. It gets into the cells in five minutes. It is the only liposomal product that will hold minerals. Okay. Uh, there are loads of other options, but if you're asking for that particular, um, that works. That works very well. High ferritin with normal iron levels and in, in, yeah, inflammation, if without the major diseases, any solutions to the lower ferritin? Well, uh, I would look very much at any viral illnesses. I would start thinking about lactoferrin. Okay, lactoferrin will help lower the, lower the iron, okay, lower the ferritin. Uh, it depends on how level, how high we're talking about. Okay, when you see that, a lot of times you're talking about viral illnesses and they're starting to deposit the ferritin into the mitochondria and that's one of the reasons for mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, is whole genome testing within used in your practice if a person comes in? All right. Is the whole genome testing with provided interpretation at the time and when the science comes out used in your practice? Um, are you talking about a genome or epigenome? Okay. The epigenome is what we work with. It's what's, you know, uh, affected by the environment. Other types of uh, genetic testing for the genome, you're kind of looking for, you know, additions or deletions or, you know, things that cause um, strange diseases. So um, if a person either comes with it already done or gets it done through you, um, I use epigenome. Uh, if I use genome, genomic testing in my practice a lot. A lot of times people come to me with it so I can read them all. Okay. It doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't have a particular one. I say, Oh, you have to get that. Okay. Uh, sometimes they'll have a 23 me with nothing. And I may run through a different uh, program because, you know, for my own edification, but if they come to me with genetic testing, um, I put that into their, into consideration of their treatment. How can we easily test mitochondrial function? You can't. 
<laughs> okay. No, I'm not being facetious. Okay. Um, right now, the AONM in the, in the UK has mitochondrial testing. Okay. But unless you're a practitioner and you know what you're doing, um, it's going to be expensive and you have to know what you're, what you're looking for. Okay. And, I, and it's funny. I was just about to ask someone, uh, uh, Jillian um, Crowther, uh, if I could get those tests in the United States. Okay, because they're very they're very um, important. Nevertheless, uh, it's not an easy thing to get. It's usually expensive, and what's worse is you really need someone who knows how to read them. Okay, knows how to interpret them. So I can, um, but they're not easily gotten. Where you go, go to a a o n m dot org, and that's where you're going to find the information. Okay. How do you or others do tests for neurotransmitters? Uh, the tests for neurotransmitters are usually done by urine, uh, and there are various companies that do it. Um, Labrix, um, Vibrant Labs, uh, a bunch of companies, and they will test the actual neurotransmitters within the urine. There are some companies that will test neurotransmitters in platelets. Um, the serum neurotransmitters are also valid. Um, but the urine ones are adequate. They're easy to get, uh, and, and you'll get a, a good idea of what the balance of neurotransmitters are. MDL labs only one band above 60 at 94, band 41. Would I have Lyme? Been having gut issues since 2014. Liz, if you have one band, or well, I'd like to know what the other bands look like. But let's say, for argument's sake, that there was only one band, the 41 band that was high. That indicates you have co-infections, okay, that you have to look for. Um, you might have Lyme, might have to look at the whole test, okay? But uh, if you've had gut issues since 2014, that needs attending to, okay? Uh, because that's where your inflammation is coming from. And maybe repeating the MDL test and looking for co-infections. Okay, MDL, I like MDL a lot. Okay, they're not, if you're paying for it yourself, they're not super expensive, different from Igenex. If you really want to know a, a lot more, you would th you consider Armin Labs in Germany. Uh, they do very good testing, rather expensive, but very good testing. And again, you want to work with a practitioner because picking out the testing is important and interpreting it is even more important. Hope I answered your question. Do you find that recent elevation in general societal exploded EMF has significant effects on our systems and does it affect healing? Absolutely. Okay, listen, the more sick, the more sick, is that English? The more people are exposed to environmental toxins, including EMFs, the more it affects healing, okay? Especially when you have chronic cell danger response, because as part of that, you're unable to get rid of your heavy metals, okay? So you're breathing heavy metals all the time. If you look at somebody's uh, heavy metal test and, and you see a lot of things up that are, you know, where they get this, you know? It's coming from the air. And since the cells can't get rid of it and there's more metals, they're going to conduct the electromagnetic fields in their bodies more, okay? And on the other side, the electromagnetic fields that are being that we're being exposed to are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You can get an EMF detector for your house and find out where the uh, where the hot spots are, and they do sell these little you know these um, cloths that you can put over things and over the router and so forth. Okay, that will cut cut down on it, which is usually worth doing. Um, simple things like not charging your phone by your bedside near your head, okay? Should be out 15 feet away. Not having the router in the bedroom, okay? Turning off your router at night is always a good idea. Unless somebody's doing something, there's no reason to have it on. But it is affecting healing. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the environmental toxins that are out there. Does PEA increase dopamine? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, I may be wrong, but not that I'm aware of. 
And should you be avoided if your dopamine is high? Well, think about this. What causes the dopamine to be high? Okay, it's because of chronic inflammation. Okay, so if we can knock down the chronic inflammation, or at least use this as a Band-Aid for a little while, okay, the dopamine will drop. Now, mind you, I said the word Band-Aid. There's no dishonor in using a Band-Aid. The dishonor occurs when all you do is use a Band-Aid and you never look for the source of bleeding. So if you constantly, it's like giving somebody 5-methylfolate or methyl B12, that's a Band-Aid. You're not fixing anything, okay? And if you keep using it, all you're doing is saying, hey, I'm going to sell this patient methyl B12 for, the whole, for their whole life. They don't need that. You've got to fix the pathway. Okay, so I don't know that I would avoid it if your dopamine is presently high because dopamine is part and parcel of the inflammatory problem. Of course, if you start taking it and you feel worse, you stop. Okay, let's make sense. Please spell PEA on full. I'm sorry. Palmitoethanolamide. <laughs> Good luck. High lead levels. Okay, well, there is the chelation. When you say chelation challenged, uh, there's a couple of ways of getting rid of heavy metals that aren't nearly as tough as using things like DMPS, EDTA. Um, there is a product called Toxin Pole, uh, which has cilantro and trace minerals. Sometimes you can just treat with heavy trace minerals and use a binder. That's one way. Uh, there are some experimental things out there that I am not allowed to mention uh, that I tend to use that work very well. Um, I would avoid straight chelation. Okay, there are gentler ways of going about it. Uh, if this is a if this is a real challenge for you, you might want to give me a call or send me an email, you know, so I could be a little bit more specific. Okay, but high lead levels are are not overly difficult to treat. The problem is they're in the brain, especially with a kid. You got to be real careful about how you treat it because you don't want to create any more problems. The Justin error shows me it's not test for. Uh, I'm sorry, Barbara, I don't understand the question. Um, I have to go back to only because I'm answering them one at a time. Does GABA help reduce anxiety? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, GABA, GABA made butyric acid, is what the mammalian brain uses to calm it down. The difficulty here is when you're taking a water-soluble GABA, if it does, in, and it's out there, pharma GABA, a bunch of things, a lot of times that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And if it doesn't, then you may not have the decrease in anxiety you're looking for. On the other hand, if that kind of product does cross the blood-brain barrier, okay, yes, you'll get decrease in anxiety, but you also now know that you have a leaky blood-brain barrier, which is usually viral in origin and so forth, which has to be addressed. Now, other ways of getting GABA into the brain these days is to use a liposomal product, okay? Uh, and there's a couple of companies that make liposomal GABA. One makes liposomal GABA with L-theanine. L-theanine will cut down on uh, glutamate, okay? They used to, used to be able to get phenylated GABA, which is also known as Phenobut, but the FDA pulled that off the market pretty good. And I had been using it for years without problems, but it's near impossible to get these days. Um, Mandy, you're going to have to contact me personally because um, I'd have to get a few people together for that neurotransmitter course. And I am going to be doing a master course on um, uh, mood disorders and neurotransmitters for um, functional DX pretty soon. So yeah, just, just contact me. I'll be happy to talk with you about it. Does glutathione affect methylation or methylation affects glutathione? Uh, let me let me answer it this way. The body is simply intricate and intricately simple. Okay, everything affects everything. All right, if methylation is not working, okay, depending on where, you're not going to be able to create your your uh, phosphatidylcholine for your cell membranes. You're not going to be able to create muscle. You're not going to be able to do a lot of things. 
Okay, you're not going to be able to turn on and off all the genes because your methyl donor, which is uh, Sammy or Sam, goes around and puts methyl on different places so that certain genes work, certain genes turn off, and that's where it's supposed to be. Your glutathione pathway uh, is partly creating glutathione, which is a GSH, and then when it's used up, it creates oxidized glutathione. That's the endpoint. It's called GSSJ. But the great power in his, in his infinite wisdom gave us a recycling mechanism that took that oxidized glutathione and would be able to recycle it back to the active form. Okay, so that's important. So if you're unable to recycle and you have a buildup of the oxidized, that's going to block the entry of what's called the electron donors into the mitochondria. It is the main reason for mitochondrial dysfunction. That was discovered by myself, Sean Bean and Ben Lynch about 10, 15 years ago. We saw that relationship. So when we started treating that, a lot of mitochondrial function got better. How that was treated because NAD, that's an NAD dependent pathway. You can either use NAD or B3. But you have to be careful with B3 because too much B3, you can hypomethylate somebody. I told you it's complex, okay? Um, also, um, superoxide dismutase uh, and how it uh, creates uh, hypochlorous acid is part of that pathway. Okay, there's a lot of interactions between that pathway. So they all interact with one another, one way or another. Okay, so that's why you can't treat one thing. You can't treat the methylation pathway by itself. You must look at the entire person. And if somebody tries to be a specialist, I'm a methylation specialist, walk out the door. Okay, because if all they have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay, we don't need any more specialists. We need generalists. Okay. What if they should see a naturopathic versus an FMP? Um, interview them, see who you feel the best with. A good naturopathic doctor has got an eclectic background. A good functional medicine doctor has got an eclectic background. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who do you feel best with? Who's got your best interest at heart? Okay. You can look at it from a specialty point of view, jo Joanne. Okay. Young adult stubborn candidiasis, also histamine intolerant, lifelong eczema, low sugar diet, and I'm plus treatment with nice diet, and it's not effective candida. Any broad ideas? Broad ideas, I've got ton of, tons of them. I uh, know what to expect, but thought you may have this type of case. Wow. Um, all right, if you're, if you're already using Nystatin and uh, you're already on a low sugar diet and uh, the histamine intolerance, this is, all, this is all leaky gut or leaky cell stuff, okay? Um, there's loads of things that can be used for candida, but you got to fix the gut first, okay? Otherwise... Uh, you're just going to make somebody very, very sick. Uh, if you're looking at the genetics, DAO may not be the reason that they can't handle histamine. Okay. Uh, it could be something else. It could be the aldehyde dehydrogenases. Maybe, maybe the can candida produces acid aldehyde, which is formaldehyde. Okay. And if they can't break that down, okay, think about having formaldehyde in your system. So um, what's happening here is that you're shooting at individual targets. You take a step back, start healing the gut, start healing the cells, okay? And then go after the candida a different way. By the way, you want to get rid of bugs? Best way to do it is make the environment inhospitable for them, okay? Candida likes a nice acidic environment. So look to make somebody alkaline. Besides, if somebody's not alkaline, they can't run their entire Krebs cycle and, and uh, mitochondria and so forth. Um, there's a lot I could say about this, but, um, you know, you're doing the obvious things. And if the obvious things aren't working, you have to step back and say, hmm, okay, what else can I do? And, and in a broad sense, I'd be looking to fix the gut and, um Maybe if they have the genetics, look at what else. Um, this is a young adult. If they drank alcohol and they get drunk very quickly, like they're a cheap date, that means they've got too much aldehyde. 
Okay. So looking at what the cofactors for the aldehyde dehydrogenases, dehydrogenases are. Okay. Those are some of the things you can do. Sorry, I can't give you like a super specific answer because believe me when I tell you, I ask a lot of questions when I'm, when I'm treating somebody. Do you find recent elevation in general studies going to be significant on our systems and does it affect healing? I.e., do city dwellers provide greater difficulties than country folk? Uh, yeah, they do. Is it EMF? Is it the stress of being in a city? I'm from New York City. Oh my God. Okay. So, <laughs> city dwellers um, sometimes uh, have worse problems. Um, country folk have a problem with uh, trace minerals um, if they're on farms, parasites. Okay. And the biggest problem with country folk, if they're anywhere near farms, is glyphosates. Everybody's got their problems. Okay. I personally don't see one over the other because my practice is very specific for that three or 4% of the people who are not getting, um, not getting uh, answers elsewhere. Okay. So um, it may be just because of my population. I think I answered the dopamine thing with PA already. Okay, suggestions for biotoxin illness mold. Do you think it's critical to move? Uh, yes and no, Dan. Uh, number one, if you have a lot of mold in your house, it's got, you've got to get rid of it. There's ways of doing it without having to do mold remediation, depending on how bad it is. Um, if you're in the United States, uh, you can use something called concrobium, which is available at Home Depot, and you can rent the fogger and get in your basement and fog the whole inside of the uh, house so you can kill all the mold that way. Okay, it works really well. Um, if you do that, and then you can start the process of pulling the mold out of the body, which is basically utilizing glutathione, um, kidney and liver support, and a very, very good binder, okay? Uh, it depends on how bad it is and how bad the person is, okay? Um, really, if the person's suffering horribly, uh, then you may want to move out temporarily. Uh, it all depends. I mean, it's really, it's a tough question to answer. It isn't critical to move, but what is critical is the source of mold has to be eradicated. Otherwise, the individual will never get better. All right, no problem. <clears throat> the Victory Nutrition product, it's, um, it's called Protovite, P R O D O. V I T E. Okay, uh, for polling, that was the same answer. Well, thank you, JD. I appreciate your uh, your kindness. The probiotic I showed on the screen. Did I show a probiotic on the screen? I think it was this was protovite as I showed on the screen. Um, hold on. Here you go. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, Philip, I just got one word. Palmetto. Oh, thank you. He spelled it out for us. Palmetto ethanolamide. Thank you. How do you find a reasonable Lyme doctor that knows about cow infections? You know, I'd say go to iLads, but um, I'm not sure. Sorry. If I if taking reasonable amount of methyl B12 and methyl folate does increase their dose, does increasing their doses help? Um, the first thing I ask is, does taking the methyl folate or methyl B12 help at all? Okay, I mean, depending on what it is it's helping with, okay? In other words, you know, is it doing anything good? So increasing the doses may or may not be helpful, but if you need to increase the doses, you gotta ask yourself, am I helping the pathway? Am I fixing the pathway? What's wrong? So that's, that's where I would go with that. Kimberly, I would be interested in taking a neurotransmitter course if you'll be teaching one in the future, yep. Uh, just um, go to my website or go to um, office at drjessonline.com or just at drjessonline.com. Just let me know you're interested or let my assistant know you're interested 
and I'll, you know, talk with you personally about it. I'm using GABA cream, Colson, which is rubbed behind the ears to bypass digestion and enter the brain via the vagus nerve. Vesta, if it's helping, it's helping. That's something I haven't heard of before. It's called Somnum. Okay, I'm definitely going to look it up and see it would be helpful for my patients. I appreciate, you know, I learn a lot from my patients and other people. And I have no ego when it concerns my patients. I have the ego the size of Cincinnati, of course, but <laughs> no, seriously, I love learning things. Thank you very much. Cystic adult acne with leaky gut. Yeah, um, almost all, all, all skin conditions are leaky gut. Okay. And if you haven't treated leaky gut and you've got a skin condition, ask yourself, will I hurt anybody, including myself, by treating a leaky gut? by giving myself digestive enzymes and demulcent herbs and stuff like that, the answer is goose egg, all right? But if I don't treat the leaky gut, whatever the inflammation is doing is going to continue. So we've, if you took a test for leaky gut and you said you didn't have it, you probably have it, okay? And it's one of those risk-benefit things, okay? Um, I think I answered that already. You mentioned autistic several times. Do you have much success with healing? Yeah, I have I have a very, very high level of success with autistic children. You're most welcome, Danielle. JD, you're most welcome, brother or sister, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, most spores can travel through drywall, but what usually happens is houses have, you know, air currents. Okay, so the mold grows, the spores go through the air currents, and they kind of shower somebody. Okay, that's usually what happens. Okay, You're most welcome, Philip. Pyler Hoffman, where do you buy um, Amazon? You can buy um, Protovite by from Victory Nutrition International, and I think it's vnilife.com. Uh, you don't have to sign up for their multi-level marketing thing, but you can become a preferred customer and still get the discounts, okay? If you have difficulty with it, just let me know. Be happy to help you out. This is a very good, excellent product. They make really good products, seriously. Can I suggest a good digestive enzyme? There's, there's a ton of them. The one I tend to use the most, most vest, blah, 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 Vesta is um, made by now. And I, it's super enzymes because it's got Betaine hydrochloride, pancreatin, oxbile, and a whole mess of vegetable enzymes. Okay, and I get the capsules, and I take one or two per meal. That's one of the general ones I use. Pempeak. Is scleroderma morph uh, morphia caused by leaky gut? It's possible, okay? Again, if you treat leaky gut, are you going to hurt anybody? Is there any risk to doing it? No. If you treat it and it gets better, it may be a component. It may be the whole reason. Okay. Is it going to hurt to try to try to treat leaky gut and see what it does? Okay. I, I, I just keep telling you that, that it's not a bad idea. Pauline, when can you get an MTHFR test? Uh, you can get them from anywhere. You know, um, you, if you're just going to test for MTHFR, LabCorp, Quest, they all do it, okay? Not going to tell you much, but, you know, I would really suggest that either you get Stratagene so you can see the whole pathways, or at least um, if you did 23andMe or Ancestry.com, you'd have to get their raw data and put it into another uh, program, probably MTHFRsupport.com. That program uh, with data costs about $39. Um, but honestly, the strategy is going to be your best bet. Okay, unless you're just looking for the one polymorphism. Uh, acne treatment, this is a young person who is scarring. Uh, again, if you treat the leaky gut, you're going to start getting at the, um, you're going to start getting at the reasons for the acne. Okay, you get part of that is going to be helping the pathways um, drain and so forth and so on. So, uh, you can stop that process. The scarring may be a bit of a bear to get rid of, but you can stop the process. At least that's a good start. I got all the questions done. 
So thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciated your company and thank you for an excellent talk, Jess. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And the last question is, will also the colitis be helped by leaky gut treatment? Yeah. Well, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye, you everybody. Bye-bye.